we'll get started. Would you mind, Tara, just to, so Tara, yeah, if you don't mind, just seeing if you can turn that light off, because there are quite a lot of pictures to look at. Yes, if you feel more comfortable coming closer, then please do so. Um, my topic is spinning a story, so it's about, it's, I'm using the concept of storytelling, but looking at how um, language that weaves grammar and lexis can be studied through story. And the story, the, a particular book I am, I'm using for that, uh, because it's particularly rich in formulaic sequences that I want to look at in a little more detail, um, I've chosen a book, uh, an American book, The True Story of the Three Little Pigs by A. Wolf, which is actually um, not the traditional story, but it's a modern, postmodern take on the, on the traditional story. So let's just see if this is working. Yes, perfect. I'd just, I'd just like to begin with the usage-based view of language development. Can I ask how many of you are familiar with that? The usage-based view? Okay. Um, so there are so many different views on language development, on first language learning and second language learning. This one is becoming more and more popular. And it's, um, it's actually um, proven uh, in my opinion to be absolutely correct because I live in Norway and in Nor now and in Norway my students and the children at school they come to school with English and do you know why they come to school with English? It's because there's so much English in the environment so the usage based uh, view of language is that we get language from the environment um, we interact with language, but just reading language and listening to language is also interacting with language. That's why it's the usage-based approach. And so it has a lot to do with input, yeah, as well as output, but certainly input, the usage-based view of language development. So in, in Norway, they are so lucky, they get away with just two lessons of English in a week, and they are still fluent by the time they come to me at the university and they want to study English, they are fluent. Uh, because they've had so much English from gaming, from the internet, from reading, from listening, particularly extensive listening. So the source of meaning, uh, according to the usage-based view of language development, is not in the individual words. It's the idiom principle, which varies according to context. And um, it suggests, and I'm sure many of you have heard of this, that no more than 40 and 50 percent of our utterances, of what we say, are created each time newly using lexical items and syntactic rules. A lot of what we say are chunks and they come out uh, in, the, in, the, in the same way that we've used them again and again. This is true for native speakers, it's also true for non-native speakers. So language acquisition is exemplar based and not innate. We acquire these chunks uh, in much the same way that we uh, learn to walk by practicing. We learn language by listening, practicing, speaking, listening again, uh, acquiring uh, language, uh, and according to the exemplars, according to the, the chunks that we hear again and again. Um, so we understand these patterns. I use the word patterns rather than rules because rules sound like um, explicit grammar learning, and this is not explicit grammar learning. Um, so understanding patterns is developed by engaging with the input, not only listening and reading, but also trying to understand the input, which of course children do when they are gaming, when they are listening to films. The films are not dubbed, of course, in Norway. So this, every time they watch a film, they are hearing language, the English. In this case, it's usually the English language. American films, uh, films from any, any part of the world where English is spoken. Um, so the second language is created and strengthened in response to input and opportunities to interpret utterances. Of course, it's the responding that is very important, not just, uh, but listening is not a passive. We don't talk about listening anymore as a passive skill. It's not passive. When we're listening, we are working on the language. It's a receptive skill, but it's not passive. The same with reading. Um, so um, the form, uh, Utterances, uh, so, sorry, the second language is created and strengthened in response to important opportunities to interpret utterances and we form utterances in the course of communication. The second language input must be frequent, this is what the, uh, the linguists say, frequent, noticeable, salient, useful, meaningful. 
This is the important point. Frequent, lots and lots of repetition, salient, it must be exciting, interesting for the children, for the students, uh, useful, it must be able to use the language, and meaningful. I myself am not a linguist. I am, uh, my area is subject pedagogy, so I, my students are all going to be teachers of English. So I teach them how to teach English in school, and I teach them uh, how to teach literature in school, because in Norway they learn both English and literature in the English lessons. Um, so that's my area, but obviously second language acquisition is very relevant for student teachers, so I need to teach that too. So this is the book that I'll be looking at. It's not even a new book, but it's a, very, it's a, it's a, a quality picture book, one of the many picture books that are studied by literature scholars. Naturally, I do look at children's literature scholarship as an important part of my work. Okay, um, these are just some examples um, of um, designs for the title page uh, in the picture book because this is a task that I would suggest, and I'm not going to ask you to do this today, but this is a task that I would suggest when looking at this picture book with 8th and ninth grade students. Um, but this is Norway. Here in Germany, uh, sorry, in Germany, that's the other country I've worked in many, many years. Sorry, here in Japan, you might be using this at university. My students are also university students, and I use this picture book to show them about, about formulaic language. And it's actually a very complex picture book, so it works fine with university students. It doesn't work fine in the primary school. It's too difficult and complex for the primary school. Um, so these were 12 and 13 year olds who suggested a design for the title page after they had heard the story but not seen the title page. Uh, this was one of my student teachers here who also suggested a design for the front cover. Student teachers like doing this kind of active uh, task as well. And in Germany and, uh, oh, if I turn this off, no, it's still on. In Germany and Norway, we make our um, teaching very interactive at the university. So do you know the, the traditional tale, the tale of the three little pigs? Yes? So most of you are nodding. So another task I often ask is for people to, um, to, um, to uh, create a dramatic uh, version of the traditional tale. Um, we're quite a small group here, so I'm, I might just divide you into two groups for tasks and not make it too active as it's near the end of the day. Um, on the other hand, you, maybe you do need to stand up and do something a bit more dramatic, we'll see. But first of all, just for those who are not quite familiar with it, this is the, um, the refrain that is repeated in um, any um, children's uh, version of, or usually adult versions too, any, um, any version of the three little pigs. Uh, in graded readers, they often simplify this. That's one reason why I am not in favor of graded readers. I've just come from Rod Waring's presentation. Um, I am in favor of extensive reading, as well as deep reading, looking more closely at literary texts. But I am not in favor of graded readers because they always change the language. And as soon as the children pick up another version of uh, the three little pigs, it will be this one. This is the traditional version that you find again and again. And it's actually useful. So the big bad wolf knocked on the door. Anybody want to read the big bad wolf? Anybody want to volunteer? Yes, please. Little pig, little pig, please let me come in. Perfect. Would anybody like to answer as the little pig? Perfect. And I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow your house down. So he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house down and ate up the little pig. Excellent, well done. That was a wonderful rendering of the traditional uh, refrain. So, absolutely, absolutely. So let's, um, just before we start the story, let's just have a look at formulaic sequences. Um, the Alison Ray definition is the best known. The form, maybe you just have a quick look at that. Just read that one quietly. <clears throat> so that, that is what I tried to explain. I'm not sure how well I explained it to you, but that is what I tried to explain uh, rather briefly, um, that um, it's, 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 we have it whole in our minds. We don't uh, generate it uh, using grammar when we speak fluently. But these are the many words that are used um, instead of formulaic sequences. We don't have to say formulaic sequences all the time. We can say chunks, we can say multi-word units. 
Idioms are slightly different, but idioms are formulaic sequences, so are collocations and phrasal verbs. We can also say ready-made utterances, words, strings, and semi-prefabricated phrases. You find all of this in the literature. All of it's fine. What is not so easy is actually recognizing them, because there are, we, no linguist absolutely agrees where you end what is a formulaic sequence and say, OK, no, that's not really a formulaic sequence. But that's what we're going to try and do today. We can do it just as well as the, the linguists, I'm sure. So chunk learning, um, learners pick up these chunks or formulaic sequences from input. Um, so just things like, I don't know, it's a formulaic sequence. There's no way that any of us as fluent speakers have to put together those words, I do not know. It just comes out as a whole. Can I have a, I want a, these are the kinds of formulaic sequences or chunks children learn in the primary school in most countries already. Um, and only gradually they, they discover that, um, that there are um, component parts that they can take out and use in different sentences. This may take years for them to discover. So the grammar, according to Nick Ellis, is not, I'm sure you all know him, a well-known linguist who uh, talks about this input learning. The grammar is not rule-based but becomes rule-like because the children recognize the patterns. Um, and that's just a reference to one of my, um, one of my publications. Okay, so what we are doing today, um, we are looking at a story which is very motivating. So I just put this together here um, because um, I wanted to um, suggest that we get we reach learner autonomy and learner agency, which is what we're talking about at this conference, by building up the roots of the tree by looking at uh, stories, repetition, chorusing for fun, semi-prefabricated phrases. This gives the children a lot to rely on, a lot to... Um, it gives them a lot to, um, to support their learning, to make them feel stronger, to make them feel uh, powerful, so it's empowered learning. Um, so I say, for example, creative reading, uh, looking at um, picture books, stories, graphic novels, young adult literature, adding to chunks with creative talk, so talking around the texts, creative writing, all of these help uh, the student's agency. So it's a challenge, it's input plus one, it uh, improves receptive and productive language use and finally leads to learner autonomy when the students can read and find their own texts um, and don't need the teacher's help so much. So let's begin with the story. So, first of all, think, pair, share. What do you predict about this version of uh, the true sto of the story of the three little pigs? That's the wolf, as you can see. So, how? What would you predict? Looking at this um, page, I'll just show it to you in the book. It's not the front cover. So here. What would you predict? How is this maybe slightly different to the story that we all know? He doesn't look very scary. Why not? He's got his spectacles. His spectacles makes him look less scary. Yes, that's true, isn't it? And his tiny teeth. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And anything his else? His eyes are little, and his ears are little. Everything's little. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Tiny hands like trunks. <laughs> Does that make him look uh, more reliable or less reliable? Is this a reliable narrator or a less reliable and unreliable narrator? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Actually, think pair share means, this is something I always teach my, my student teachers, it means first think for a moment, then talk to your partner, the person next to you, all right? So, and then share with everybody. You don't need that because you all have agency. But um, in Norway, I think, I'll take this again. I know it's a little easier when I've got a microphone. In Norway, the students are a little bit like those in Japan. They are rather shy. And so it really helps them first to have a moment just to talk to their partner. And then if they feel confident, they can share with the whole group. That's this um, think pair share that, that we, I use a lot in Norway. Okay, thank you. I'm not quite sure how the time is going to be. Um, uh, 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 yeah, it looks as if I shouldn't spend too much time talking now. Um, so these are the tasks. 
The first one um, we can, um, or we've already done to some extent, present a dramatic reading of the traditional refrain. You did that even without any practice, because you're so clever. But task two, that is definitely going to be a group that I, will, I would like um, to, um, to have here as a, a volunteer group to, to note down signs in the illustrations that I'm going to show you on the screens that suggest that this might be a less than truthful version of the traditional tale. So task two is particularly looking at the illustrations. Task three, um, you've already seen some examples of task three, so I won't ask you to design a title page. But task four, that's another group, I would like you to identify some of the formulaic expressions the wolf uses. Now, I'm not going to show you all of the pictures, and I'm not going to show you, um, I'm not going to show you all of the text. I'm going to read it to you. Okay, so you have to listen. Some of the text will be on the screens, and m some of the pictures will be on the screens. Okay? So, let's see. Who would like to do task two? Could you just put your hands up? Task two. That's looking at, that's looking at the <coughs> illustrations. Thank you, Tara. Okay. Task two. You can't really manage two and four at the same time. Either you're going to be listening for the, uh, the formulaic expressions, the formulaic sequences, and noting them down, or you're going to be looking for signs in the pictures that suggest this is not a reliable narrator. Okay, I'll ask you the uh, next one. Who, is going, who would like to do task four? Writing down the formulaic sequences. Everybody else just wants to relax and enjoy the story. Is that right? Yes. Aha. Uh, yes. <laughs> Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. My students are much more hardworking than this. Yes, did you have your hand up? I'll do something if it helps. Oh, yes, please. Yes. I can't find my notebook. Ah. You came here to Japan, to Nagoya, without notebooks. Interesting. Um, Ironically, I did. Just like students. You've got some paper to, to share. That's wonderful. Yeah. No paper, no excuse. Um, right, you get your paper. So what about here? Which task would you like to do here in the I middle? I found it yeah. <laughs> Ah. Um, which, which task would you like to do here in the middle? Pictures or form leg sequences? Ask your neighbor, share, I don't mind. You can do things together. It's fine. Who wants to do pictures? Put your hands up again. Okay, that's fine. And everybody else is going to write, make notes on the chunks. Okay, the form next sequences. Afterwards, you can share your notes before you have to share it with everybody. Okay? Um, I'll give you time for that. Right, so I need to start the story. Okay. Don't make the mistake one of my students made. This was a student in Germany, a student teacher, a major in English. She enjoyed the story, then she went home and asked her mother to buy it online. And her mother, she told her mother it was written by Alexander T. Wolf, the, the story. And her mother, she came back to me a week later and said, no, we can't find it anywhere online. Yeah. That is the narrator, not the author. Okay, so let's get this back. Um, is it okay if I have this here like this and I can turn the pages better? Is that okay? Right. Everybody knows the story of the three little pigs. Or at least they think they do. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Nobody knows the real story because nobody has ever heard my side of the story. I'm the wolf, Alexander T. Wolf. You can call me Al. I don't know how this whole big bad wolf thing got started, but it's all wrong. Maybe it's because of our diet. Hey, it's not my fault wolves eat cute little animals like bunnies and sheep and pigs. That's just the way we are. If cheeseburgers were cute, folks would probably think you were big and bad, bad too. But like I was saying, the whole big bad wolf thing is wrong. The real story is about, is about a sneeze and a cup of sugar. Way back in Once Upon a Time time, I was making a birthday cake for my dear old granny. I had a terrible sneezing cold. Achoo! I ran out of sugar. So, I went next door to ask if I could borrow a cup of sugar. Now, the guy next door was a pig, and he wasn't too bright either. He had built his whole house out of straw. Can you believe it? 
I mean, who in his right mind would build a house of straw? So of course, the minute I knocked on the door, it fell right in. I didn't want to just walk into someone else's house, so I called, little pig, little pig, are you in? No answer. I was just about to go home without the cup of sugar for my dear old granny's birthday cake. That's when my nose started to itch. I felt a sneeze coming on. Well, I huffed and I snuffed and I sneezed a great sneeze. Achoo! And you know what? <coughs> that whole darn straw house fell down. And right in the middle of the pile of straw was the first little pig dead as a doornail. He had been home the whole time. It seemed like a shame to leave a perfectly good ham dinner lying there in the straw, so I ate it up. Think of it as a big cheeseburger just lying there. I was feeling a little better, but I still didn't have my cup of sugar, so I went on to the next house. The guy who lived there was the first little pig's brother. He was a little smarter but not much. He had built his house of sticks. I rang the bell on the stick house. Tilly ling. Nobody answered. I called, Mr. Pig, Mr. Pig, are you in? He yelled back. Go away, wolf. You can't come in. I'm shaving the hairs on my pinny, chinny chin chin. I had just grabbed the doorknob when I felt another sneeze coming on. I huffed and I snuffed and I tried to cover my mouth, but I sneezed a great sneeze, a chew. And you're not going to believe it, but this guy's house fell down just like his brother's. When the dust cleared, there was the second little pig, dead as a doornail. Wolf's honor. Now, you know food will spoil if you just leave it out in the open. So I did the only thing there was to do. I had dinner again. I was getting awfully full, but my cold was feeling a little better. And I still didn't have that cup of sugar for my dear old granny's birthday cake. So I went to the next house. This guy was the first and second little pig's brother. He must have been the brains of the family. He had built his house of bricks. I knocked on the brick house. No answer. I called. Mr. Pig, Mr. Pig, are you in? And do you know what that rude little porker answered? Get out of here, wolf. Don't bother me again. Talk about impolite. He probably had a whole sack full of sugar. And he wouldn't give me even one little cup for my dear sweet old granny's birthday cake. What a pig! I was just about to go home and maybe make a nice birthday card instead of a cake when I felt my cold coming on. I huffed and I snuffed and I sneezed once again. Achoo! Then the third little pig yelled, and your old granny can sit on a pin. Now I'm usually a pretty calm fellow. But when somebody talks about my granny like that, I go a little crazy. When the cops drove up, of course I was trying to break down this pig's door. And the whole time I was huffing and puffing and sneezing and making a real scene. The rest, as they say, is history. The news reporters found out about the two pigs I had for dinner. They figured a sick guy going to borrow a cup of sugar didn't sound very exciting. So they jazzed up the story with all of that huff and puff and blow your house down. And they made me the big bad wolf. That's it. The real story. I was framed. But maybe you could loan me a cup of sugar. Okay, that's the story. Right, now it would be really nice if you could just get into your groups and just compare your notes on the form length sequences on the one hand, on the pictures on the other hand. I can go back through the screens to show you the pictures again. So Tara over there, the pictures on that side. Form length sequences in the middle or on the right? I don't mind. 
They're doing the chunks. They're doing the pictures over there, I think. You want to sit here? That's fine. You've got a lot. Yeah. That was the first picture again. I kind of wrote down the black and white stripe. The real story. The real story, yes. The real story. That makes sense. I have yeah. a dear old granny. Really? Real yes. story? Sorry? Is that What's a really the real story? No, he's, a, he's an unreliable narrator. Uh, <laughs> it's a version yeah. of the story. Yeah, but it's fun. <laughs> Are you doing the chunks as well? Uh, okay. Yeah, you want to come here? Nobody in his right mind. Yeah, nobody in his right mind. Yeah. You're not going to believe it? You have a huge advantage you need to share with, because we, we use these as native speakers, we use this so much, don't we? So we need to share. So they're kind of fixed. Yes, they are. They are. Some of them are semi, semi fixed, and some of them are fixed. Yeah? I think like, you're not going to believe it, or you might say you're not going to believe this, but yep. you're not going to believe it. You're not going to believe this. I felt odd. I felt odd. I felt a sneeze coming on. Yeah, we I always say that. I felt a sneeze coming on. on. I felt yes. a cold yeah. coming on. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. I felt, yeah. I felt a good idea coming on. Yeah, that's a, that's pre so that one's a semi prefabricated or semi fixed one. Uh, you can slot other words into that one. You, could you just turn around a little? Dead dead door. Door. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. The horns on the, yeah. the little ears of the I was thinking when I wrote that on the Where did the door <laughs> now? Oh, he yeah. looks like a devil. Oh, yeah. We're talking about yeah. the costume ah. and how it changes. Uh huh, oh, that's true. He doesn't really look like a wolf at all. I don't think he wants to, to he doesn't present show himself. his wolf hair until the very last picture. Oh. What do you mean? He's um, hiding his identity. Oh, hairy chest? Yeah. And here you don't see any hairiness. Mm. He's very smooth. Yeah. <coughs> all the all the wolf-like characteristics are hidden. Yeah. That's true. I just want to show you that I, I had to for the scan. I had to cut a bit of that picture off. Oh, that's his granny. The granny oh, the yes. Oh, talk about. Oh. What does that the remind you of? Granny. The dear old granny in bed. Little Red Riding Hood. It reminds you of Little Red Riding Hood, doesn't it? Mm, because of the red, mm -hmm. another fairy tale. Yeah. I think so. That's what my students tell me. I was the students are best at reading pictures. What did they think? They, they suggest it's a thermometer. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I need to move you on to the next picture. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah? Okay. There we go. So, yeah, I, I was framed. Yeah. You're a fast writer, aren't you? Fast. Yeah. I couldn't. Yeah. Go crazy, go crazy, go crazy. Yes, that's a good one. Go yes, crazy. yes. To go crazy, to go, what do we say? Go crazy, go mad, he went mad. He went, uh, yeah. We use it particularly with crazy, don't we? He went crazy. He went. Uh, can you think of any other? When, what else? When, he went crazy, he went. Yeah, I can't. It's, I'm wondering if we can slot any other words into that one. He went crazy, he went. He went bananas. He went bananas. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you need to get something? Yeah. Well well spotted that is not next door. <laughs> no, that's true. That's true. Yes, and, yeah, and it's a, yeah. Yeah, as if he's motivated if he to go there. Yeah. He wouldn't be tossing yeah. up the cup and blowing the cup. That's a good point. That's a good point. If he's mm. sick, mm -hmm. yeah. he wouldn't go so far. Mm, that's, true. that's true. Should I move to the next picture? Yeah. 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 Repetition. Which is much more creative, really. A cup of sugar. A cup of sugar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Kind of violent image, but it's, mis it's hiding something as well as it's missed. 
the cloud, the, the idea of the cloud is a kind when of the dust clears, Tell me when you think you've got them all, and then I'll, I'll... No? Not yet? Really? Oh, wow. And you know what? But we haven't really seen it. That's definitely one. And you know what? Oh, you think? Yeah. That's really interesting. Are you in? Sorry? Are you in? Is it? Are you in? Yes, absolutely. Are you in? Yeah, are you in? That's true. Both pigs were kind of... They died in the... Sneeze. The Next one. Was the, the, the head, head yeah. hidden. Like right. We the, to go back one. Yeah. That right. it, it, that pig isn't right. dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> Too pig to be dead. Too He's pink. hiding. Ah, his head in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Interesting. Okay. I couldn't find anything in that one. Really? This one. This one. Um, the sun looks dark. Is what I wrote. And then, is it a crow or a raven? It's ominous. Ominous, yes, yeah. Blackbird, that's right. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Have a cold? Have a cold, I've got a cold, to have a cold. Yes, because in other languages you wouldn't use the verb to have, would you? In German you say, bin yeah. Yeah, 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 I found that with my kids. So that mm. I'm saying, do you have a brother in this? <laughs> like, have a brother. Mm. <laughs> Have a cold. Yeah. But there's no bell. But there's no bell. This is a collocation. Have a cold. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Collocations are formula are formulaic too. Right. Mm. Mm. And then, yeah. yeah. I'm just interested in how well, there's more dense la there's more language mm -hmm. than a book which is just just the repetition of the the basic. And more, it's more useful for real communication. Yes, but in a way, this is repetition because it's communication we use all the time because it's so formulaic. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like more you know useful. what, you know, you know it's what. More it's useful. Very, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. more yeah. useful in terms of because how many, you know, how many times are your kids gonna want to say by the hair on my chinny chin chin? <laughs> but I, I like in the traditional refrain, I like the use of the future because in some, um, I'll, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down yeah. because in some languages they would use the present there. Uh -huh. So the Germans have difficulty learning that to use the future in that way. Mm. I don't know about Japanese, I don't speak Japanese. There is no future. There's no future. So it's a good example of the future then. Yeah. I'll half and I'll It's puff. true, and the, that use of the future is. Yeah. Like, uh, so, can we go on? Yes. 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 Oh, I've done that one, haven't I? No, 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 no it's another one. Oh, yeah. Well, well, that's what I was saying. Like, both of the pigs were in the same position, but like, the, with their head covered and just their, their hind ends. It looks like a plate with yeah. forks and knives. Like, yeah. It's just, just like, like yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it's a table set. There was. That's so. Oh. Uh, that, those kind of dramatic expression mm, mm. when you there was there was the second little thing oh, yeah. mm. yeah. mm. 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 yeah. mm. and the narrative that's mm. so useful yeah mm. yeah it's not my fault yeah. i went into the room and there was my brother you know? mm -hmm. They also look like marshmallows <laughs> <laughs> marshmallows oh it makes me hungry <laughs> next picture yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay have we nearly finished? We're coming, I almost coming to the last picture. Okay, good. <coughs> good. So if you want to take your seats, it's up to you. If you want to, want to stay here, I don't mind. What do you feel? Also, stay there if you're comfortable. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's right. Necessarily okay. Is that wrong? But something I just noticed mm, yeah, now is that a door? That's, that's supposed a to be a window. door. No, that's but, a cell. But like, it, you would be normally knocking on a door to try to get in, right? No, let's, yes. let's have a look at the. I'll have a look at the book. Yeah, that's a good point. Too. I mean, I'm just saying, like, no, there's no obvious the door there. Right, because like he's in the story, he was he was knocking on the door or something, right? Well, there were all sorts of things in the story. And here, he was ringing, he was ringing the bell, and there's no bell in the yeah. wooden in the wooden house. So Where I was it? presuming, uh, yeah, presumably, there's, there's he's no at bell the door there knocking to, ring. to get sugar, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If he's not at the door to get sugar, why would he be in front of a window? Absolutely. <laughs> You don't go to a window to get That shot. is definitely, you'd be a good detective. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. we need to finish now quickly because I need to get on to the other. Actually. To the next. I got nothing the on this, but I think somebody pointed story. out. Hmm? The sugar thing was just yeah, a story. Yeah, the cover. 
Yeah. <laughs> but wait, is that a cup, of, a cup that's in the photo? Well, I don't know if it's a photo. I think these here are, um, the, these are reporters, exactly, microphones. No, 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 I mean, in, in, the, in the hand of the wolf, is that a cup? <laughs> Okay, so let's go back and uh, look at, first of all, shall we have a look at the, what you found in the illustrations and then we'll look at the formulaic sequences. We do it like that? Okay, so let's just go back and find out what you discovered. We already looked at that one, so we'll do that one next. So, do you want to tell us what you found in this picture? No, we're going to keep it. Uh, no, you are not going to keep it secret. All of his wolf characteristics are hidden. Okay. They're a pinstripe suit. Mm -hmm. And um, he's very messy. And there's rabbit ears. I just noticed the rabbit ears just now. <laughs> there's rabbit ears in there. The rabbit ears in the bowl. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh I just barely noticed that. That's oh and that bottle looks kind of like beer. <laughs> Here, this it's beer. Yeah, yeah that rabbit smoking gun right there. Oh, and, yeah. yeah, the thermometer in the mouth or a cigarette in the mouth. It doesn't look like a cigarette. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think another thing we pointed out is in this, <coughs> the first step is his suit's all messy, but it's not messy later on. And ah. Look at the white stuff in the bowl. That looks like sugar. Ah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it looks a little more granular than flour. Yeah. True, true, true. Maybe. So maybe he made up the entire story. Okay, let's go on to the next one. What do you find here? So it says that he's going next door for a cup of sugar, but that's pretty far to go for next door. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and no details. Yeah. No details of the rest of the landscape. Yeah, it's no vegetation. Mm. I remember my students uh, mentioned how he's trying to show how playful he is and how what a jolly he's fellow he is. He's, yeah. He wouldn't be throwing the cup up and blowing true. it. True, true, true. But he wants to look as if he's a playful fellow. But my students also mentioned this ominous looking shadow. It doesn't doesn't match, no. That's just like the Dracula stories, isn't it? Uh, the, you, the, the, there's a difference between Dracula and he has no reflection in the mirror, as far as I understand. It seems that you, you see sometimes truth in people's shadows and in the mirror on no mirror reflection uh, and not in how they're representing themselves. Okay, this one. I think this one's cute. He's just blown down the first little pig's straw house. It what? looks like an inferno, not a sneeze. Uh-huh, uh-huh. The pig doesn't look dead. The pig looks like he's hiding in the ground. Ah, okay. He's going to eat the pig alive. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's what wolves do. <laughs> <laughs> did, 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 he seems a bit angelic to me in the way he's portrayed himself in this uh, picture. Is that, is that the point? Yeah. That's just the way I see it. Uh, maybe. Do you see that? Have you been to Italy? He looks like a dog here still, but his um, throat is looking more wild. Okay. But I, I seem like, in, in, like an angel in the golden clouds, like you see in, in Baroque churches in Italy. Have you been to Italy? Have you seen those angels in the golden clouds? Yeah. Yes. That's how I see him here. Yeah, I mean, that's the point, yeah. I mean, that's but I agree with you. I think you're right. He doesn't, the pig either looks not dead at all, or it looks like his, his imagination of the pig, sitting there like a pink pudding waiting for him. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, next one. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Or anyway, it's a it was a dangerous-looking thing to mm -hmm. be around. That's so true. But also very ominous. That's true. I see this as the narrator, the pig, uh, the the wolf, uh, 
Alexander T. Wolfe, telling the story but also showing the story in the pictures from his perspective. So how is he trying to present the, the pig here, the second pig? Well, he's destroying the environment. I think that's what, I think that's what he, he's suggesting. That second pig is, is a vandal, destroying, cutting down all the trees like that, destroying the environment. As some of, one of you said, yeah, one of you said that ominous bird sitting there on the last tree trunk. And yeah. there's no doorbell. And there's no doorbell, so that's not, a, he wasn't truthful when he said he rang the bell. That's right, because there is no bell. Okay, and this one. It looks like a table setting. <laughs> Did you see that? The wolf is, is, is showing his colors here. The forks and knives and the spoon and it's a table setting with the pig in the, on the plate in the center. Bit difficult to imagine that it really just fell just like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is the, all the smoke seems to have neatly formed a plate for him to eat from. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this one. I think you're the first one who, over there, you're the first one who noticed that there that's not even a door. So he, he, he says, when he tells the story, I knocked on the door. But it isn't a door, actually. I, I hadn't noticed that. It's kind of devilish there. Mm -hmm. So the shadow on the wall. Ah, yes, yeah, with the uh, bit like horns like the there. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. But he's portraying the pig as looking pretty nasty, isn't he? Okay, and this one? He looks like the devil. Yes, he does. He does like now, yes. Devil. Breathing fire, that's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about the uh, reporters? <laughs> seems to be wild, but the reporters are all wolves. Well, the reporters are pigs. They're all pigs, yes, they're all pigs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, of course, is why he is claiming this was an unfair an unfair trial, which was reported in the newspaper. And what do we notice about the newspaper? <coughs> it's the Daily Pig. That's right. Yeah. Looking at the, the wolf's teeth there, studying the teeth of the wolf in the Daily Pig. Okay, and so here we come to the final picture. I didn't give you a time to look at that. But here we see his wolf hair. Yes, that's his, true. His He's no longer able to hide his truer nature. Mm, though he's quite a bit older now, isn't he? Mm -hmm. It looks like he's been in prison a long, long time. Sorry? They do in some countries, yes, they do. This is actually an American picture book, as you probably noticed. Okay, let's just... Uh, these would be home assignments I would give my students or, uh, in the secondary school or at university. Retell the story as the pig's mother. So some creative writing. Retell the story as the wolf's granny. Organize a press conference with the third little pig. Some examples of uh, some tasks. Okay, so they didn't actually all live happily ever after. But let's have a look now at the formulaic sequences. Here's the first one. Well, it's not the first, but it's the first one I have in my list. We may not have exactly the same list. So that's fine. Okay, so what, what have you written down? The formulaic sequence. What's the first one you have? The real story. The real story. It's the real <coughs> story. Okay, that's fine. And your next one? Once upon a time. Ah, well, oh, once upon a time, yes. And what's next? Dear old, dear old granny, yes, we always say that, don't we? Dear old granny, yeah, my dear old granny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A cup of sugar. Cup of sugar. Mm -hmm. In his right mind. In his right mind, yes. yes. In his right mind, make a house out of straw. Yes, nobody's ever heard my side of the story. I think you skipped that one. Yeah. yeah. I always explain to my students because story doesn't actually have sides, so it's formulaic because we don't actually have sides to a story. We have perspectives, yes. So, but you had, oh, you, I'm sure you had that one, I heard it. This whole, this whole big bad wolf thing. I'm sure you had that one. We can say this whole... Um, fake news. 
fake news thing. Yes, we, this this whole fake news thing, this whole Brexit thing. Oh dear, let's not go that way. <laughs> yeah. Thing. Yeah. So that's definitely very formulaic. Yeah. When we're expressing often negative ideas, something we don't like, this whole nasty thing. Once upon a time, you had that one. What's your next one? Uh, I felt uh, cold coming on. Oh yes, that's a good one. Did you have that one? I ran out of sugar. He said. Yeah, I ran out of sugar, I ran out of milk. That's the semi-prefabricated type where you can slot in other words. Yeah. And then you had, yes, you had that one, didn't you? Yeah. Who in his right mind would build a house with straw? Mm hmm. Okay. Next one. I'm feeling a little better. And you also said I, I th he felt a cold coming on. Is that here? Yeah. Oh, the door fell in. You had that one. Yeah. I, I heard that one. The door fell in. You do say it like this in Japanese, the door fell in? Well, it depends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, you said collapsed or something. Okay, okay. Are you in? Yeah. Now, that's very formulaic, isn't it? Are you in? Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to take away. I'm just looking for your. You already told me I felt a cold coming on. I had I think felt a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt a sneeze coming on. Yes. What else do you have? Dead as a doornail. Dead as a doornail. Definitely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. When the dust cleared. Ah, when the dust cleared. That's a good one. I don't think I have that one, but that's very good. When the dust cleared, okay. after any big uh, dramatic event, or even some little conflict, we say when the dust clears, we'll get it all sorted out. Yeah. This after, was literal. Yes, in this case it was literal, but it's actually still, we use it figuratively, don't we? Okay, let's, what else have we got? I was just about, did you have that one? Yeah, I was just about to go home, just about to phone you, just about to finish the book or whatever. Yeah, and this one you had, yes, yeah, it's very good. What else have you got on your list? Get out of here. Get out of here, absolutely, yes, get out of here. And, next one? Talk about... Oh yes, that's so. <laughs> um, that's I, when I first went to Germany. I, I tried to because I spent many years in Germany before I went to Norway. I kept trying to find how to say that in German. You can't say that in German. It's very. It's when we're um, somebody's a bit rude. We say talk about rude or talk about stupid. Something we really don't like. Talk about crazy, and it's that's difficult. In I think to find in some other languages. I think that comes later here. I've got it here. It comes later. Can you say it in Japanese? Talk about idiotic. Or it, like in the UK right now with Brexit, talk about crazy. Yeah? It's very, that's, yeah, it's very formulaic. Right in the middle. Why is this one formulaic? And you know what? It's a way of uh, it's a way of connecting two uh, yes. of the... Yes, yeah. But how can we see it's formulaic and it's not... It's an attention grabber. Yeah, and you know what? Yes, absolutely. But how can we see it doesn't... It's not just an ordinary question. We can actually see it if you look at the... How the, the sentence is constructed. You don't expect an answer. It sh who said that? Where are you? It yeah, exactly. A word is missing. A word is missing. And do you know what w could be an, an ordinary question? And do you know what happened? And do you know what was next? But when that w word is missing, it's formulaic meaning, and you know what? And yeah. yeah. You okay. And do you know what I did next? And do you know what I did next? And you know what? It could be. And you know what? As a rhetorical question, you could say that. And you know what I did next? Yes. As a, it's more a rhetorical question. Okay, you had that one too? Yeah. 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 Seemed like a shame or it seemed like a good idea. It seemed like, it seemed like, and then filling that sentence. This one. It's an American picture book, but we say this in British English too. Wolf's honor, guide's honor, scout's, uh, scout's honor, yes, yeah. But do we actually, oh, I can't read that. They just gave me a sign, but I have no idea what it was. <laughs> 10 minutes, I guess. 10 minutes? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, the brains of the family. You had that one, didn't you? Yeah? No. Yeah? The brains of the family? No? no? That's formulaic, surely, isn't it? The brains of... Uh, something. 
the brains, yeah, the brains of the, the, brains of, the group. of the group, of the committee, of the of the parliament. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about that. Does parliament have brains? Yeah, <laughs> that's why I wasn't sure about that one. We've done that one. Just why? What a pig! Yeah. <laughs> Oh, this here. I was making a real scene. That comes from the theatre, doesn't it? We have a lot of formulaic sequences from the theatre. Uh, <laughs> stop play acting. Yeah. Uh, stop acting about. Stop making a scene. Because the theatre was, was negative for many centuries. So we felt that it's not uh, serious. Uh, in, certainly in some countries, it was not seen as a serious art for many centuries. At least in the 19th century was the case. And, we, and also the 18th. And so we have some formulate language from the theatre. The rest is history. Yeah. They jazzed up the story. They, yeah, that's formulaic, isn't it? They jazzed up. They jazzed up the uh, the report. They jazzed up the they jazzed up the the what else? They jazzed up the uh, the documentary. They jazzed up the documentary, and I was framed. I suspect that comes from the old, if you think of old Western movies, you see somebody looking out uh, of the window frame. So I suspect that's where it comes from. I was framed, but I'm not sure. But that's an idiom. Okay, so there are two distinct approaches to learning language. One, treat the target language as a list, as a set of linguistic objects, words, grammar rules that can be studied and mastered. But what I've been looking at today is two. Assume that language is a tool for communicating and learn through input initially and trying to communicate. So this is a usage-based <coughs> approach um, that implicit learning is the default process. That certainly is the case when there is a lot of English in the environment. Yeah? Um, to what extent you, this is possible in countries where they only have English in the classroom? That's a different situation, but with y the younger the learner, the more it's implicit learning. Yeah. Um, it's how we learn our home language, and although it weakens with age, it's still the principal way all learners acquire English. Probably all uh, can acquire English. It's not the only way, but it's the principal way. Task-based language teaching is an opportunity for this, for implicit uh, learning, and stories provide opportunities for input-based so first listening to the story and output based talking around the story. So and the pictures and the language. This is taken from Scott Thornbury. So when he talks about um, use, the usage based approach, he talks about exposure to a rich diet of formulate language. That means watching films, reading books, um, not just uh, two lessons a week. We need more input than that. Um, focus on form, so focus on form can be what we just did, looking at some of the language a bit more carefully. Uh, the difference between and you know what and do you know what is a question. Um, positive social dynamic, so uh, group work is important to enjoy the language and opportunities for use. So and I've just got an example here, so when I first went to Germany many many years ago I had all of this. I didn't speak a word of German. I spoke French because I learned French at school, but not any other language, just English and French. So in Germany, I picked it all up very quickly. I had the input. Um, I had the rich die to formulate language. I had the focus on form because I was interested in language. I noticed, I tried to notice uh, the form. Uh, I was in the country, so there was a positive social dynamic. And because the Germans didn't all speak English at that time, I had lots of opportunities for use. Okay? Now in Norway, I've been there for three years. In German, I was fluent in Germany after six months. In Norway, after three years, I still have very little Norwegian. That's the difference, because there's little exposure, because everybody speaks fluent English, so they speak English to me. Yeah? Um, I read some Norwegian, but I, have, I don't have time to read very much in Norwegian. My topic is English. Um, I, can, I do notice the patterns, because I, I am interested in language. But I have very little social dynamic, because nobody speaks Norwegian to me. They all speak English to me. And I have very few opportunities for use, because I am very busy and have very little time. So this is the difference. This is... Um, it's basically all about input and opportunities for use. That's what I've been talking about today. Oh, I should have asked you, the title page, what do you think? Can you guess what was on the title page? 
You haven't seen the title page yet. There was just a flash I just showed you. Can you guess? The true story of the three little pigs. It's taken from a different newspaper. Oh, yeah. That's right. <coughs> that's right. Yeah, that's on. That's on the title page. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> a good example. Thank you. Okay, so formulaic sequences can be acquired through frequency, usefulness, meaningfulness, salient. The context needs to be interesting, exciting, noticeable for the students. It need, salient means they need to really be, to notice this. That's why we do need to look at the language, the formulaic sequences, for them to notice it. Okay, uh, so my conclusion, and then we have time for three minutes for questions, I think. My conclusion, provide conditions for the acquisition of formulaic language. Exposure to rich sources, to sources rich in formulaic language, such as children's literature. I didn't mention that I'm a children's literature scholar. <laughs> um, so naturally that would be my interest. Um, understanding patterns is developed by motivating input. Understanding of patterns is developed by promoting noticing. Encourage a positive social dynamic and lively communication in the classroom. And outside the classroom, I was at that um, a museum in Tokyo that you recommended, the Edo Museum, it's beautiful. And a child came to me and asked me some questions, 12, no, I think she was, I asked her age, no, she was 12, and she asked her age, so she was coming, she was a school project, and she was, uh, had been given a questionnaire to come and um, interview some uh, tourists at the museum. And she was largely reading the questions, but then afterwards, I, when I answered, I repeated some of the questions to her because I could ask her the same questions. So she heard them a second time. So this is a very, was a nice example of the task that the teacher gave those children um, to, uh, to encourage lively communication, to go to a museum and look for tourists. It was a good idea. In order to increase automaticity, the second lang language input must be frequent, noticeable, salient, useful, and ideally meaningful, which I think is possible with children's literature. And of course, young, that includes young adult literature, that includes film. These are my references. Um, if anybody's interested in um, children's literature, this is a, an open access academic journal that I edit. So you are very welcome to take the flyers. So it comes out twice a year in May and November. It's peer reviewed. If you're interested, you can also submit, a, um, submit a, an article. These, I just have a few flyers of, of my books. I just brought a couple with me if you're interested. Okay, any questions? Thank you. Any questions? I think you're all very tired, but... Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you for your presentation. Just a comment. And, mm -hmm. um, I think what's really interesting is for perhaps in the age of uh, fake news and everything, trying to ask uh, students to look for truth is really interesting. Yeah. And, um, That's true. Very good, Japanese, yes. Uh, Japanese, famous Japanese short story called uh, Rashomon. Mm -hmm. It was made into a movie um, mm -hmm. by... But it was by Ektogawa and it was made into a movie by uh, Kurosawa, Kurosawa yeah. and it's got that whole different perspectives, mm -hmm. uh, each person telling the different version of the story mm. um, and students here are very familiar with that, mm -hmm. so yeah, mm -hmm. I think this also has a theme of getting them to look for mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. which is a really nice way in. So. Or how the same event can have different perspectives, so yes. there is not necessarily one truth. No, yeah? Not yet also. Yeah, because there are different, <laughs> sli the different perspectives on the story. So it's very difficult for us, all of us, to stand outside of our own ideology to see some kind of absolute truth, <coughs> because all of us have some ideology. I think a good yeah. question as well then would be, what does, does the wolf actually believe his own story? Does probably, yeah. probably. <laughs> yeah? yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. It's about that media literacy? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Critical literacy, but it, you, we can say media literacy, but basically you can use it with any, uh, with, with, with screen media, with print media, so it's, it's an aspect of critical literacy, uh, looking at any text. I think somebody's telling me to stop. <laughs> Where did you find the picture books? Well, that's my, that's my, um, know, but that's my research or, area. How do, look? how do I look? You go to bookstores and uh, let me think, how do I find picture books? 
um, there, I belong to a number of uh, um, associations, so children's literature associations. I go to children's literature uh, conferences, so I'm getting new input all the time. Actually, I'm sorry to um, advertise, but um, <laughs> at the at the um, at the the one the last section of, of this late it's not actually this is an edited volume, so there are many contributors to this. The last section. Um, is called the Annotated Bibliography of Children's Literature, and it's in 10 sections. So the, the longest is actually picture books, and there's a, little, a few sentences on each one, and then there are graphic novels and uh, all sorts of other um, kinds of children's literature, verse novels, poetry, short stories. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's a good question. Going to, picture, going to uh, bookshops helps, though, certainly. Yeah, you certainly find. But it takes a while to really look to find what you're looking for. You've pra practically got to read the book every time you go to a bookshop. So it's actually useful to. Picture books, I can recommend um, Sandy Morrell's blog. She has a wonderful blog on picture books. But then the children's literature um, um, journal I mentioned, that also it has four recommended reads of children's literature, including young adult literature, every, every, um, every issue. And that's open access. Uh, young adult literature. Well, actually, you know, you can ask the students what they enjoy reading. That's pretty important. So I always focus on Harry Potter and The Hunger Games because the students love reading it. And you can look seriously at these books. Also for critical literacy, that's fine. Yeah? But there are serious issues, global issues in The Hunger Games. I think we have to stop. Yeah? <laughs> OK, thank you very much for coming. So